Please welcome the CEO of Anzer Corporation, Lisa Lavin. Thank you. It's truly honored to be here. Our company, Answer Innovation, is a technology company developing and pioneering an internet of things that enables being two places at once. Now, Omcare is a subsidiary of Answer Innovation. Omcare is a health technology company on a mission to extend the reach of caregivers and promises real medication adherence. Our first product, the Omcare Telemed system, brings healthcare into the home and ensures right pill, right time, right person. To actually do that today, you have to show up at somebody's door, hand them the medication, and watch them consume it. And we're doing just that remotely. Like most in this room here today, we exist to bridge a gap in our healthcare system. Omcare exists because 50% of people that are taking medication today are non-adherent. This results in spending in excess of $300 billion on, on adverse drug events and 125,000 people dying every single year. Now more than ever, we need techn technological disruptions that bridge the gaps in our healthcare system. These disruptions in convergence with empowered consumers are redefining the meaning of health and the meaning of care. It is my honor today to introduce our next speakers that are taking disruption to the next level by data acceleration to discovery. James Kugler is the Chief Digital Officer of Merck in Darmstadt, Germany. James has a degree in biomedical engineering from Washington University in St. Louis, has research experience at Harvard, MIT, in bioinformatics, computational biophysics, genomics, and genome sequencing. James joined Sigma Aldrich in 2008 in corporate strategy and planning, then moved to e-business, global new product development, and introduction and biology product management and back to e-business. As chief digital officer at Merck, James is responsible for the digital transformation of the company globally. I will also say James is a self-professed big nerd. He said I could say that. Nelson D'Antonio is the head of biomedical R&D at Palantir, an enterprise software company that empowers organizations to turn data into their most powerful asset. Nelson's interest in, is in the intersection of healthcare and data, and it began at the National Institute of Health, where his joint team exponentially reduced delivery time of experimental data, identified novel and synergistic drug combinations, and improve the predictive ability of machine learning models. Today, Nelson leads the biomedical R&D division that works with pharmaceutical companies, cancer centers, the Food and Drug Administration, and the National Institute of Health to unlock the value of data within their own organizations and remove the barriers to collaboration without compromising security and data privacy. Please help me to welcome James Kugler and Nelson D'Antonio. Thank you, thank you. It is good to be here today. Um, I think uh, I'll start, Lisa mentioned Sigma Aldrich. I think it's important to kind of hit on, on what Sigma Aldrich uh, was. So I was looking after SigmaAldrich.com um, originally. Sigma is interesting because we had the largest e-commerce site in the life sciences space. So essentially we were like Amazon for the sciences, except we also made all of our products. So on Sigma.com we had hundreds of thousands of products, anything that you need to do an experiment. Uh, so if you go into any lab, you see red tops and bottles. That was, that was us. Uh, what was cool, though, is we built some really sophisticated data science capabilities there. Basically, uh, we had teams of machine learning AI specialists. We would be able to go in and see based on kind of behavior and how products were used in recipes or protocols, uh, what experiment someone's going to do and start predicting what experiment someone was going to do next. Uh, this was really critical for us because uh, we had to figure out where in the world we were going to ship one of our 600,000 products so that it could ship within 24 hours to a scientist anywhere. Uh, it looks very unsexy as, as, you, uh, as you see where this actually materializes on the site. Essentially, you get product recommendations, but 
behind the scenes on this, there are about 150 machine learning models that are going on uh, on that page load to predict what is right for that user at that time. Uh, in 2014, we were then acquired by Merck KGAA Darmstadt, Germany. Uh, this is not the, the US uh, Merck & Co. Um, Merck KGA was founded in 1668. It's the world's oldest pharmaceutical company. Uh, and this year is obviously a very important year. We're celebrating our 350th anniversary. And the company is still majority family owned. So the 13th generation of the family uh, is still very involved. Uh, where we differ primarily from Merck and Co. is we have three lines of businesses, right? So we have our healthcare side, will always be the, the world's oldest pharma company. Uh, we're very involved in immuno-oncology, neurodegenerative disease, as well as fertility. Life science side that Sigma rolled into uh, is looking at basically how do you enable scientists globally to do research faster. And performance materials that fewer people know about, but uh, basically invent the future of things for us. So uh, the biggest product there is liquid crystal. So all of you who have phones or laptops or flat screens, there is a very high probability that the liquid crystal in those displays are actually uh, from us in, in, in Darmstadt. Now, upon acquisition, uh, essentially the company said, let's, let's get digital, right? They wanted to have this digital transformation. And coming from the, the Sigma.com side, which is very much kind of an e-commerce driven organization, um, we said, why not? This sounds pretty fun. Let's, let's try to transform the world's oldest pharma company that also happens to be German. Uh, and and we, we started by saying, how are we going to define digitalization? So we started by defining it as essentially how do we reduce friction and create value by integrating technology into everyday life. And the way we wanted to do this was set up a framework where essentially we started with user experience. What are people actually doing? And can we do something that is genuinely going to make that person's life easier by uh, integrating technology in, into what it is that they're doing. If we provide technology that genuinely makes someone's life easier, this is good, right? We create value. Our ability to then extract that value gives us a business model, which is also good, because that gives us some sustainability. And as this grows, we start generating a lot of data. And so our ability to then use that data to make that person's life even easier and the business model more lucrative, this is the framework that we wanted to, to operate in. Obviously, a, a key part of this was data, right? Uh, and so with the hubris of, of a the company that was just bought for $17 billion, predominantly for like e-commerce and data science capabilities, um, we, we rushed in to see what we could do in other parts of the business. And we, we were quickly, uh, deeply humbled as we started looking at the healthcare side when we realized that the state of the data was, was less than optimal. Uh, we had a handful of systems in the life science piece that were managing all of the transactions, so it was very easy to deal with this structured information in a way that we could create value from it. Uh, we were humbled due to, to babies. Um, and, and the reason for this was we were having difficulty predicting and forecasting our fertility products in China after the uh, one child policy was reversed. And so we sent one of our top data scientists to, to China to try to work through this forecasting problem. Her name was Claire. Claire went to, to Yale undergrad, uh, studied stats, Columbia grad school, studied stats, actually published her first peer review paper in a stats journal when she was nine years old. And she, she got to China and spent three months trying to find any data that she could to help better forecast our, our fertility sales in the country. Um, after three months, she wound up with basically monthly sales of fertility products for the past 18 months, uh, which isn't terribly good for building a very advanced model, nor is it very good for retaining top data scientists when they're spending months just trying to find very basic data sets that are there. And so we, we took a step back and essentially said, if we want to create value from data, uh, four things need to happen, right? One, you need to have data. This is kind of self-explanatory, right? But two, this data needs to be structured and usable. Uh, then you can apply basic to advanced analytics to generate insights, and finally, someone needs to act on those insights. And what we found was that people tended to focus on part three of this problem. And most of the tech companies that we talked to had some black box solution where you're feeding something in and getting a prediction out. The problem is what you need to feed in is structured 
data where you, you know what features and facets are important. And, and it's this part of the problem that is deeply, deeply complicated. It's a horribly unsexy problem that you can't do anything from un unless you figured it out. Uh, this is very much easier said than done. This is actually a depiction of an insurance company. Uh, and each dot in here are all of the data sets that they have, the different databases that are there. Each connection then is a join until you finally get to the top, which is calculating an insurance premium. This is not unusual, right? Especially at large global companies, we have about 53,000 people globally. This is what brought us to start working with Palantir to begin with. Palantir is a company that deeply focuses on just how do you make data structured and usable by putting it in the hands of the people who know the context and the meaning of this information. Um, and what it allows is a way to see a very structured view of the entire lineage and allows the end user to actually create these joins and build very robust and secure data pipelines. To give you a, a sense of kind of our before and after here, when we had Claire in with three months finding one product line at a monthly level for the last 18 months, uh, we were able to do in two months all product lines at extremely granular levels on a, on a nearly daily basis. The core of this has been how do we allow people to do what they do better, right? And this is something Palantir has focused deeply on made a first class problem. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Nelson to talk through a little bit more about what they do on the Palantir side. Hello. Thank you, James. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Nelson D'Antonio, and I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Palantir and uh, our customers in healthcare. I need your clicker. This is the magic one. Yeah. Yep. You fix that? Yeah, right that's, that's the one. Oh, now it went the wrong way. There we go. OK. Um, at Palantir, we make software for data integration and analysis. Uh, our goal is to help organizations turn data into their most powerful asset. Uh, and we build software based on a simple principle, to put data in the hands of the people who know it best to augment the human, not replace them. Palantir was founded in 2004 uh, in order to help the intelligence community uh, combat the issues outlined in the 9-11 Commission Report. Uh, you see, at this point in time, uh, intelligence agencies were having a very difficult time integrating data, analyzing data, and sharing data fast enough to keep up with the emerging threat. And while our first customers were in uh, defense and uh, and uh, security uh, intelligence, um, we feel that this problem is way more universal. Uh, we believe that every large organization has a problem similar to this, where they want to bring data together in a complex security environment and then empower people to use it. Today, we have customers in dozens of industries, from banking to automotive, uh, media and manufacturing, ph pharmaceutical, uh, regulatory, and so on all of whom are using Palantir software to do things previously impossible with their data. And so James gave you an excellent example of our work in pharma, but I'd like to continue with other healthcare partners who are accelerating science and discovery using Palantir. And to do that, I'm going to bucket these examples into three categories, each which builds upon the previous. So the first is improving a critical workflow. Organizing data around a single process in order to enhance that process and then inform other processes. Moving on from a single action to the entire organization. Connecting disparate data. What benefits emerge when you're able to look across the entire landscape? And lastly, looking outside of your organization, connecting the entire industry. Uh, how do we leverage data from different institutions in ways that benefit and incentivize everyone involved? And so to talk about the first one, the critical workflows, I'd like to reference our work at the National Institutes of Health, which began with a robot. Uh, this robot facilitates high throughput uh, drug screening, which is an important process in drug discovery and personalized medicine. And in a completely reductionist and oversimplified way, here's how it works. So the ro robot will orchestrate plates of patient samples and drugs, combine them, incubate them over a period of time, and then turn that into raw experimental data. An informatician will then pick up that raw experimental data and transform it into the uh, drug response curves that you see at the end of the equation on the screen. A biologist then comes in 
uh, analyzes the drug response curves and then makes decisions around new combinations, new hypotheses, uh, you know, continuing research, et cetera. It's a fantastic process and it works really well. It's very cool to work with. Um, but as was told to us by the CIO of this institution, uh, there's a major, major problem. It leaks data throughout the entire process. In the early stages of planning and scheduling, most of that happens over email. Uh, so it's very difficult to go back uh, in the future and figure out exactly what happened in that experiment. Along the same lines, the uh, experimental runs of the robot, the data that goes into it, is not necessarily the data that comes out, adding an extra complication into figuring out exactly what happened in this process. Uh, once the experimental data output comes out, it can take an informatician uh, or a series of people anywhere from a week to three months to process this data and turn it into uh, drug response curves, slowing down the entire process. And making that even worse, when they're doing it, they're checking it in and out of different databases and losing the provenance of what happened, making, it, making the raw data almost unusable because you can't tell how it connected to the analysis ready. We heard this problem and we were like, okay, that's what we do, data, let's do it. And so uh, we organized a team of experts, informaticians, biologists, uh, and uh, data engineers to come together and bring each of their pieces of the pie, put them into the platform and create one integrated system. And in doing so, uh, we changed it around. So today when you run an experiment on this uh, high throughput screening robot, uh, you can see your experimental results the same day. Uh, we removed that one week to three month barrier for both people inside the institution as well as external collaborators. Uh, along the same lines, because all of the data existed in one system, uh, you can now do new things like compare experiments apples to apples. Uh, it increases the ability to reuse data and it also allows the biologists to test the hits from their drug screen against all uh, previous experiments. And then along the same lines of the data being integrated, you now can inform advanced algorithms to suggest and create new experiments that weren't possible before. So going from a single process to an entire organization, I'd like to talk about another partner within Health and Human Services who is having trouble integrating data from thousands of clinical trials. Um, their, their problems were very common. Uh, differing ontologies across data sets, uh, difference in standards of codes, and just generally it's difficult to collaborate on a data pipeline with many people. Um, and, the, and the reason this is difficult is because it's hard work, like James said. There is no magic solution, you just have to get in there and do it. And so that's what we did. We joined with our partners and in a matter of weeks we put together, uh, integrated over 500 clinical trials. And the results were astonishing. Almost immediately you could see a different uh, view of these experiments and identify things that weren't obvious before. Uh, an example of that is shown here on the left side of the screen with uh, the abstract from a poster presented at this year's ASCO uh, where we and our partners identified adverse events uh, from immuno-oncology drugs in patients with heart conditions. Um, this type of uh, meta-analysis for efficacy was, was not possible until you had integrated the data in one sustainable uh, way. But now that it's there, our partners are continuing to leverage the statistical power of this uh, valuable data asset, and we expect to announce uh, more publications in the near future. So for the last example, connecting your industry, um, I'd like to shift from healthcare and talk about our work uh, in aviation. While this is something we think is exciting for the healthcare industry, uh, we have experience with it with our other partners who are collaborating in radical ways. Uh, and, and we love our work in healthcare. Uh, it's been extremely impactful. Um, however, there is a major challenge uh, in reaching this goal of accelerating science discovery, and that's accessing data. It's very difficult to share data in healthcare, and it's also not always incentivized. And this was absolutely the case for our partners at Airbus when we first started working together in 2015. Um, we started our work uh, similar to that first uh, process I was talking about with a single workflow, uh, using our software to help uh, accelerate the production of the A350 aircraft. Um, and as we were, the pilot was successful and we were looking for more opportunities, all roads led to this idea of sharing data across institutions. Uh, some examples, if airlines would share in-flight sensor data to uh, Airbus, Airbus could then improve the production of their aircraft. 
And then if Airbus was willing to share faulty part or uh, data around faulty parts back with the suppliers, suppliers could improve the quality of their parts. And likewise, if suppliers could look into the error logs of airlines, um, they could then help the airlines debug complex issues, which happen quite frequently, and so on and so forth. But the problem was none of these players had the infrastructure nor the incentive to make this happen. So to make a long story short, in 2017, Palantir and Airbus launched Skywise, a data platform backed by Palantir Foundry, uh, where all of these players, uh, Airbus, airlines, suppliers, and more, are collaborating over data, data and analytics. And already we're seeing results in airline manufacturing or airplane manufacturing, operations, customer satisfaction, and much more. It's very exciting for the industry, but it's almost just as exciting for the individual businesses involved in terms of the things they can now do. And while it took a lot of creativity and negotiating to bring everyone to the table, uh, this is absolutely game changing for their industry. Now, I, I think it probably goes without saying that uh, airplanes are, are not the same as humans in this, right? Um, but if, if we look, there are some core elements here that, that still remain. I mean, if we want a step change in, in research, we need a scalable mechanism for understanding what is happening and why, right? And if we break it into these core components then, uh, you know, simply having that, we do not have enough data on the healthcare R&D side to be able to find the types of things that we want to be able to find, such as stratifying patients in immuno-oncology studies. Uh, that said, no institution, no individual institution has enough data to be able to do this. And so this sense of, can I just bring a lot of folks together is great, but institutions in their own right can't even fully leverage the data that they have today. And unless we solve that problem, we can't look at how we start compounding it. Once we have this, then the question, are, are, are there even scalable tools that allow this type of analysis at scale? And when this kind of all comes together, we, we see a current ecosystem that has an unmet demand for insights. And so this is something that gets us deeply excited. At, at the core, we, we believe deeply that this, this very unsexy problem of simply how do we make data structured and usable has widespread massive implications. Particularly when we look at disruption, in my mind disruption is how do you take industrial scale and, and add technology in a way that is really hyper scalable. And we have a 350 year old company with deep regulatory knowledge in the healthcare space, channel to every scientist on the planet and a partner that is very deeply involved in building some of the best technology for solving uh, these really critical challenges that are here. And this is getting us very excited. And so with that, we want to thank you for, for letting us discuss this here. And uh, feel free to bug us afterwards to discuss some more. Thank, thank you. you.